And in this episode, you can expect to learn exactly how to do 33 transactions or more using social media, using mailers, specifically the social media side, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. His golden nugget is genius because it forces you to truly think about not just who you want to work with, but what are their pain points? How can I solve their problems? This is The Agent Goldmine, where you'll find real talk, talk, and ambition. We're here to build real businesses and be more than your average agent. We want to know what the killers are actually doing within their businesses, the reality of it. All tactical, no fluff. So we're here to find out. Please share and enjoy. Welcome back to another episode of The Agent Goldmine, where today we are interviewing Matt Thomas. And in this episode, you can expect to learn exactly how to do 33 transactions or more using social media, using mailers, specifically the social media side, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and all the tools associated with it. Uh, Because you guys know I don't I don't do Canva, but he goes deep into Canva and the AI associated with Canva video munch is first time I ever heard of that. And a lot of other things along with focusing on your specific avatar. So being that we're recording this in the beginning of 2024, his golden nugget is genius because it really, the questions that are on this golden nugget force you to truly think about not just who you want to work with, but what are their pain points? How can I solve their their problems? So download that golden nugget and focus on who you want to work with, no matter what time of the year you're listening to this on it doesn't have to be the beginning of the year whenever you want a revamp on who you're working with this is the episode to listen to right and more about our guest matt thomas so matt grew up in a real estate household his mom was an agent but when he graduated college he actually went for a career in corporate technology sales and was a top performer in tech sales prior to being like i never want to do this anymore but i still like sales so let me pivot to real estate. And he is out of Chicago, Illinois, and he's been an agent for six years since January of 2018. He has closed over 200 transactions, 60 million plus in in volume, and 33 closings in 8 million volume this past year in 2023 as a solo agent. And some updates <laughs> about me and Allie. Allie, what is what has been going on lately? What are, what are we going to update them here with? <laughs> per, some personal stuff. So yeah. a couple of days ago, I took a million dollar listing. It's my first million dollar uh, because, as you know, the majority of my clients have been so far military. And we got actually got like finally got the actual, what do you call it, notification on Brit's status. So she is being medically retired in March, meaning we are making the move probably a couple months after that. It's getting real. So real. Yeah. Dude, some other alley notes that you did not mention is that today you were crowned the impactful pillar of all of 2023 for having the biggest impact on our five pillars community through positive energy, your wild craziness, your comfy clothes, uh, all uh, just like going out there and crushing it. So like we also have a powerhouse pillar, which is the you know top number of transactions, which technically, you know, if we just did transactions, like you won that too, you did 44 transactions this past year, um, 36 referrals, eight that you closed personally um, for over 16 million in volume. So I just wanted to give a shout out to you, Miss impactful and powerhouse. Um, but the, the other, the other person who got a crown is Jason Boyce. You guys have heard him on here before. Likely he, um, is not primarily a referral agent. So he, as a regular agent closed 41 transactions, 14 and a half million in volume and 345 plus thousand in GCI. So anyway, I mean, but who cares about him? Allie, you are, (laughs) you are the crowd human. Congratulations. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the shout out, dude. Like looking back at this last year, I worked f-ing hard and I know Jason, Jason's awesome. He works yeah. hard too. And it's, it's just cool to be a part of a community with other hard workers, you know, like, uh, I don't want to talk poorly about others. I, I've spoken to other agents outside of five pillars, of course, <laughs> that are just like struggling, you know, like, Hey, I want to do, I, I did eight last year. I want to do hopefully maybe 10. 
I'm like, why is that on your only like, let's talk, you know, like we can do more than 10. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad to be a part of this community, dude. Thanks for the shout out. You're welcome. And uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's several of them. I, I was talking to goals with a, a couple of the pillars yesterday and there's a, uh, one of the pods, all of their goals is to close 60 transactions this year. So, um, which <laughs> love it anyway, but enough little updates about us. I think ladies and gentlemen, the agent gold mine listeners, uh, welcome Matt Thomas, Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. So are we, <laughs> dude, Matt, tell us how and when you, and why you decided to even become a real estate agent. Gosh, the why is such an important part of it, but we'll back up to the how and the when first. So for me, real estate has, there has literally never been a part of my life where real estate wasn't omnipresent. Um, my mom is going on 30 plus years in the business. I grew up in a household where I was going to the open house or on the showing or whatever, just out of necessity. Uh, my father was a police officer, so I couldn't really go to work with him. Tough there. But I would go with mom and I learned and I knew forever that I wanted to get a license. And it was completely selfish at first. It was like, I want to buy investment properties. That seems like a good way to do that. I started my career out of college in tech sales and I made my way to Chicago. And I came to a point where I had reached like the pinnacle of tech sales. I was actually honored on stage as being the top sales rep in the company. And the only thought going through my head was, I don't want to do that again. Uh, and so what I took that to mean was, I knew I was a career salesman. I was just in the wrong spot. So I went and got my license and I decided to refocus and retune my skills and just started servicing uh, residential at that time, real estate in Chicagoland and haven't looked back. That was 2018. Uh, I've grown a business now where I think this year we just crossed. Uh, actually, I put it in my email to you. I was very excited. 60 million in closed sales. Uh, and I helped my 230th client um, just this week. So it's been a long ride. It's been a lot of clients along the way. But in all of that, I think the why truly and sincerely for me was sales is a skill. And I think it's one of the better life skills you can develop. There are many people who use it in a capacity in which it doesn't actually service their clients. And they will sell a product or they'll sell a solution or however they want to frame it. But at the end of the day, it's not actually driving a tangible benefit to the receiving end of that product. And for me, that was really difficult to stomach. I would sit in these B2B corporate conversations and sometimes I wouldn't necessarily feel like our solution was genuinely the best, but obviously it was the best in that situation. And that's a tough uh, divide to be in. So in real estate, I get to advise my clients based on what I actually believe to be true and help them make decisions that are lasting and impactful. And we don't have to sell a product that I can't stand behind. Yeah, th that's the one thing that I, I realized I ha I don't have a sales background. Real estate has has been the only sales job that I've had. But as I'm like talking to other people that have sales backgrounds, they're just especially if they're like a lender in a, in a specific company se selling their product, they are either brainwashed really to believe that their product is the best yeah. as opposed to being like a broker. And you know, so us as real estate agents, we can say this house is not the best product for you. Let's continue looking. Unlike a lender stuck with one company, they're like, no, this is the best product for you when really it, it might not be, you know? So what was the biggest trend that you took from your sales tech into real estate agent sales? Ooh, I love one line. And I actually, I think I may even have included in the bio that I gave you. Uh, people don't care what you know, unless they know that you care. And that's universal. It was true in B2B sales. It's true in real estate. It doesn't matter how well versed you are on something. It doesn't matter if you have the right answer. If you can't prove to somebody that you care enough about them that their interests are being taken care of, you know, like the, the conversation goes nowhere. Um, and I think that that trend, it's not even a trend. That's just like a tried and true staple of good salesmanship. Do you have any lines, like any specific, um, for example, um, would it be helpful if, or, you know, th those lines, like, are you like a script person in that way? Or are you just at this point, it's just so embodied in you that like, I don't know, hit, hit me with something. There are certain that. things I know that I say repeatedly, and I think I don't catch them as much, but other people will push back and be like, did you just corporate lingo me? I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, things like, um, this is a great plan. My primary concern is right. 
learning to avoid but in a sentence is a really powerful thing but puts people on their heels and like they're not ready for what comes next it's that yes and exercise that some people learn in improv so in sales you learn to just move past it so it's like yes that's really great here's my concerns <laughs> just leave the butt out um so yeah i do a lot of that uh, and i also think that is something i use in sales actually yes and so when clients give me an idea I build. I'm a I'm I'm an instigator, if you will. So if you hand me something, I'm gonna say, that sounds fantastic. What if we did this? And I'll present you back with an even grander version of it in my way. And hopefully it's received well. If not, you'll knock me back to where we need to go. But I think that creates really strong relationships when you take somebody's idea and run with it. Thank you for listening. Out of respect for your time, we want to make this show as valuable as possible for you. So if you have any feedback on how we can improve, please let us know. DM us at Allie the Agent and The Shelby Show. Being that you're good with scripts, are you finding where are your leads coming from? Are you cold calling? Are you doing mainly social media? What's the biggest bull? So when I got into real estate, uh, I did not have a local network here. Like I'm not from Chicago. I don't have family here. I have some friends. I did go to Notre Dame and they end up graduating quite a few people here, but not people that I knew. So I was like, I need to figure out how I can just get in touch with the biggest network possible right away. And for me, social media was a no brainer. Uh, That was like, Day one, I saw Ryan Serhant. I was like, that guy gets it. He went from being a hand model to a billionaire, like he's on something. And that has continued to be a lead source for me. So at this point, I get anywhere from two to five leads a week uh, on social media. And the range really highly varies because they keep changing these damn algorithms. But when things are working, it's two to five leads a week inbound. I wouldn't call them cold because they know me through my content. So they're semi-warm leads. Um, searching for active opportunities in Chicagoland within the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, I do a fair amount of cold prospecting myself. Uh, This year, I've started my local neighborhood. So a mailing campaign, a social media ad campaign overlaying it, and then circle uh, circle dialing uh, or circle prospecting, depending on how you want to call it. I've never been big on open houses. I don't know. In my mind, they live next to fishing. You sit and wait and hope something bites the bait. And like, I can't wrap my head around it. So I use my weekends for other networking. And really, that's where the the bulk of my business comes from is just the referral side of things, and taking care of my past clients, making sure that I stay in touch with them and actually see them face to face, so that I continue to get referral streams long term. That's dope. Would you say that that's the order of the quantity, like majority come from social media, and then the just this year, it started to flip. So it used to be in the reverse, I would say it used to get almost all of my leads were like, I would go to networking events and meet people and stay in touch and stay in touch in a friendly way with no ask for business until they were like, aren't you a real estate agent? And then that was it, right? So I did that at Notre Dame networking events. I did that in my personal life. I did that at every real estate meetup that existed in Chicagoland for like three years. Um, And that was where most of my business started. And then as I was doing that, the social was going, it was just small, you know, I was making a lot of content, I never really gave up, I have 1000s of videos out there. And over time, I was starting to learn like what worked and what didn't and what actually would get clients versus what was just content fodder and like throwing it out there to be scrolled past. So I started to refine the way I was doing content, less paid advertising, more really focused natural ads or natural content. And Uh, Over time, that started to work. So last year, I ended up doing about 30% of my business from social media. This year, I would, I'm hopeful that it'll be about 50% of my business. So I can do about half uh, social media, and then the rest of it will be referral um, and sphere. Dude, I think that's so important what you said about in the beginning, you went to these networking events to meet people, or you know, you mentioned the mailing campaign and um, ads and circle prospecting to bring people into your world and then like nurturing them through socials in a very authentic, organic way. But I feel like that's the piece that a lot of people miss when they're like, I want to lead generate by using social media. And then they just start posting and they have, you know, 127 followers from their high school friends, their mom and their mom's sister. And they're like, why am I not getting business? Well, it's like, you know, social media is a great freaking authentic nurture when you have people who are kind of your target audience or your ideal client to watch your yeah that's exactly right but you have to fill that and i it's funny so shout out mom because like you have your early supporters my mom is like every video i've ever made and i don't miss that so you know shout out but uh i do think 
I, and I actually, I coach other agents to turn social media into a business generation source for them. So uh, I've done this with many people. And often in our first conversation, we sit down, I say, show me your profile. And it's 40 videos in a row of like, here's how to buy a home. And, and here's what to expect from the buying process. And here's what's going on uh, this year in the 7.0 contract. And it's really, really sound information. It's also like super highly focused. And it's only valuable to somebody who's in that buying decision moment, maybe like right then physically. Uh, so for me, I was like, I think you need to reimagine what social is. Social is not the chance to get on and just tell the world how smart you are uh, by constantly bombarding them with real estate information that you possess. Social is a way to connect with people who you genuinely want to connect with. And in those connections, sometimes you will find there is value exchange. So the people who are connecting with me generally want to know about Chicago. They want to know about what's happening in the neighborhood here. Maybe they want to know market stats, but more so they get an interesting view in the city from somebody who's living and working in it day to day. And I invite people into that when I meet them in person. It's as simple as I stop carrying business cards and I'm like, if you want to connect, I will text you physically, take your phone out and we're going to exchange info and I'll send you my info and or follow me on social here. All my, you know, my tag is the same on each one. Let's connect, reach out. I respond to messages. And over time, I think that's been really well received. It did not work overnight, but the result of it is I don't need a, you know, 50,000 follower pool to have success. The 5,000 that I have on Instagram has, you know, paid for it, say tenfold just by being patient and being authentic. Before we go continue into this, the socials, can you let us know which ones you're focusing on? So you mentioned Instagram. Mm -hmm. What else? In my opinion, YouTube is far and away the biggest opportunity, like not cut, dry, go start a YouTube and become your local expert. Um, that is where I spend a lot of my time and it is where my most valuable leads come from. YouTube is like the way people search now. So if they're searching, you know, buy a home in Chicago and you can trend well for that, I will get that lead. And that's where my mindset is at for 2024. Second to that, I think social is a web in my mind. It's not even, I shouldn't explain it like a ladder. It's all a web. So everything is to drive people elsewhere in my social presence. So if you find me on TikTok via a meme that I made and it was stupid, but you liked it enough to stick around and you follow that to YouTube, or you follow that to Instagram, then maybe you get a little bit more value. And then finally, you stick on the 20 minute video that tells you something reasonable about Chicago. That's where I get people down the chain of social and into booking a call on my calendar. So for me, it's all about feeding the net, right? Like, can I make my TikTok drive people to my YouTube drive people to my Calendly? Like, that's how I'm looking at it. Perfect. And how, how would you do that? How do you drive for someone that follows you on Instagram? Yeah. Doesn't follow you on YouTube. How do you drive that traffic? One of the easier ways to do it, I think is to take snippets of your longer form videos, the highlights, if you will, and leave a hook. You don't want to like, I'm a marketing background. So when you leave a hook, if you leave something unanswered, you get like the Sopranos ending, which is going to leave, you know, blows people's minds. It's very controversial. They don't know if they love it. So you need to give them some of the answer, but you want to leave a big enough hook that they want to come back and watch more, right? So making the short form video, for example, with highlights of the longer video of this conversation, for example, we would take a 30 second clip. It would be really interesting portion of this conversation for social something enough that someone says, wow, if I knew more about that, I would be really valuable in my job, or that would make my life much easier, or that would give me a bunch of time back. And then from that snippet, they want to go learn more about what that is. And that's the long form video, right? So if in the 30 second clip, you can get someone to believe that learning more about the Chicago real estate market would be beneficial for them in 2024, because at least they could make a sound buying decision. That's it. That, that thought right there will take them to YouTube to watch the video where I talk for 20 minutes about the Chicago real estate market. And if they watch that video, whether they click the link right then or not, they are far more likely to reach out and get in touch with me when the decision making time comes. And if they listen to the video, they'll probably click the link right at the end and schedule time to get ahead of 2024, because that's what the video is all about. So it's it's about leaving just enough info to be useful, to be helpful, to give somebody something they need, but not everything. You give them a crumb so they come back for the piece of the pie, and then they have a piece, they want more, so they buy the whole pie. That's how it goes. 
That's exactly what I was going to ask, ask next was, do you say, because sometimes a lot of people do cliffhangers, right? They're just like, right where they're going to spill the secret. Yeah. That's when it's like, oh, follow me on YouTube. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Do you do that? Do you do the little cliffhanger or do you just say, hey, this is all I know. If you want even more, follow me on YouTube. That one, the latter. Absolutely. You got to give them something like don't. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Don't gatekeep. Don't gatekeep information. Don't resource guard things. Like I've always been an open book. I'll share strategy. I'll share whatever. But I, I feel the same way when I'm making content. I'm not there to try and like sucker somebody in or make them stay for something they didn't get. Or I've I've done those videos too where I watch for a minute and I'm like, wait, make sure you wait till the end. And I wait till the end and nothing happens. I'm like, you just wasted my time. Like the one thing I can't get back is time. So don't waste it. So I don't do that. I, I think tell people what they're gonna get make it enticing enough that they want more and they'll go seek it. Um, but you can do that without being deceptive. Okay. If I'm listening to this, I'm, I'm already getting a little bit stressed because you have your YouTube going, you have the TikTok and Instagram and it's all driving traffic, but you're also selling, you know, and how, what does your time allocation look like towards your content creation? How are you managing all of the things? Definitely. So Time blocking is your friend. My Google Calendar looks like a Christmas tree. It's just exploded with different colors and blocks of like what I need to do in a day and where I'm supposed to be down to this call and what's happening after it. That's how I survive. Um, and with the content in particular, I batch everything. So, you know, for example, this morning, I did some editing. Yesterday, I did some filming. I had some editing this morning. I had content to post, but that's stuff that I filmed and edited in the past. So you're just trying to bankroll for the future. I will spend an hour or two filming content. And honestly, once you get better at doing it, depending on how well you do and how much you want to rely on scripts or whatever, you know, an hour of content for me, I can film probably 15 reels worth of content, maybe more. As long as I've scripted them out and I've thought about it, I can just sit and talk to the camera. And then, you know, I just have stuff I need to edit later. Editing a reel might take you 15 to 20 minutes per reel with some practice, depending on what it is. So you got to leave that time too. So the hour or two that I do of filming, if I've made 10 reels that I need to get to, I'm leaving myself a couple hours at least of editing time. But again, it's all about bankrolling for the future. So if on Monday, I can film 10 on Tuesday, maybe I only edit two. Now I've got two. That two gets me through the week of posting content. And then I can get to the next Monday and film more and next Tuesday and edit and post more. And you just get better at scale. And for me, I've gotten better at leverage. So um, I've used editors in the past. I actually do edit most of my own content at this point. Um, I've just found better tools, specifically some um, like AI tools and things that help me edit down longer form video to shorter form faster than I could. Uh, and that has been able to you know, increase my output. We love tools. Yeah. What are what are the tools? What are your favorites? First off, Canva is amazing. If you haven't played in Canva for like more than an hour, there's so much stuff in there that blows my mind every day. But that is how I make every like all the YouTube thumbnails and how I branded all of my personal pages, how I make my profile picture on on Instagram, which everybody asks about. I don't know, like you make everything on Canva. So just like get that and use it, start there. But I also use like Munch. Uh, Munch is an AI editing tool and it'll like take a long form 20 minute video and spit out several short form videos. Um, vid, video AI, it's V-I-D-Y-E-O, I think, uh, dot AI is another one, same exact idea. Uh, but the where I use AI is twofold. Is like there have been some editing, uh, especially with Canva and other things where you can edit the background. So you can make a reel more interesting. It'll be, look like this, me talking to you, but I can put some stuff in the background that isn't really there. That's awesome. Um, but more so it's the editing. Like if I, the amount of time, as you know, that it takes to edit a 45 minute clip and to try and find five, six, seven, 60 second clips that you want from it, it's just time consuming to go through it. And you got to get the final version first and then narrow it down and down. So AI for me is like editing. It, how can I edit five videos in 10 minutes? Using Munch, I can get it down to, you know, 10. I can get 10 videos probably. Have you used Opus? And do you know what the difference is between Munch and Opus? I don't. I haven't used Opus. Okay. Because I've used Opus I, and I've never used Munch. So I'm, I'm curious. But, yeah, you should. And um, they're also or, new that like I pretty much just take any trial I can get and like see if it's good and then, you know, stick around for a little bit. Yeah. But um, I w I'm open to all new AI tools because I think that's sort of the future of long form editing. For Canva. I do 
with Canva. I you hate gotta it. Get on Canva. I am so not creative. Oh, I hired it out. I'm like, I don't even care if even if I got to the point where I was like really good. It just oh, that just doesn't it, fill my. It kills you know? her. Like, yeah, she's it dead. Kills me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So well, I would say if you don't want to do that, that do there like are places Canva. like Coffee and Contracts and places and like that's how they made their money coffee and contracts which is now a part of bam like they started just by making thousands of canva templates for real estate agents pretty much like real estate agents like you were like i know i need this i know i need to do it i hate doing it and i don't want to so like there's plenty of resources like that too to not do it yourself <laughs> okay and but for those that do like, what do you specifically do in Canva? Because I know that Canva now has more AI in it. Yeah, it does. Um, you say that you're you're using Can. So I guess talk about the AI. Like, what specifically do you do in Canva? Yeah, so think about it like this. Um, and, and all of this is coming back to, we're talking about growing a business. And for me, my business is focused around growing my brand. So Canva is something that directly feeds my brand. Canva is what makes my YouTube look presentable and professional. Canva is what makes my covers on my reels look professional, right? So that's where I'm using that or even where I'm getting B roll footage. So more recently, some of the videos I've done has been talking about areas of Chicago or talking about developments in Chicago in in that I don't feel that you need to stare at me for 60 seconds. So I will insert B roll and using shout out to another app I love. Uh, I will use CapCut uh, and just go through and like edit everything. So uh, CapCut lets you put the pictures in there as a back roll. Um, and then you can, uh, you can actually have B roll footage when you're talking. So again, this is all about elevating my brand to make it look bigger than a one person show which it is. But uh, when everybody sees it, it looks professional. And that's what Canva allows me to do. And where I'm using AI is, for example, I think a post I did recently was top coffee shops in Chicago. It's like a throwaway, but it's a really good engagement post. And that's why I do things like that. But the video for it, I went like AI do a cappuccino overlooking Chicago on a snowy day. And it did. I It's on my uh, Instagram right now, if you want to look at it. But there's uh, and, you know, AI can make any sort of like stagnant background. I need a, um, a footage or in a photo right now for you. And I think that's super powerful. It's a little weird and it uh, can be a little scary, but that's where I use it. You know, I use it for everything to make me look bigger. I'm so curious as to, so you mentioned you had an editor and then you went to doing it yourself. Why, why? Two reasons. Um, I do think, and this is sort of changing for 2024. Social is always on the move. But 2023, there was this real like grunge movement happening where people went away from wanting to see quality and they went towards like you rough moving on your phone and just like organic content was doing better. Uh, and people were more receptive to that and the apps liked it more. Now it's starting to move back a little bit towards highly edited, highly professional is a little bit more favored or at least getting a little bit more play. Um, but it comes in waves. For me, the editing that I saw, I feel was a like little overdone. I don't love overly done videos. I feel like that's like if you need 15 graphics to make your point, the point probably wasn't strong enough. So just make a better video in 15 seconds and take out all that extra stuff. So for me, the editing, I wanted to simplify it. It was like, I don't want to distract from the message. I don't need it to be overly flashy. The editors I were working with um, had a little bit of a different direction and they wanted to make it boilerplate. You know, they're working with 15 clients, so they wanted to make it look like their other 14 clients because that was easiest for them. So it just didn't work. Uh, for me, it was like this creatively is making me look like everything else that you see on social media. You mentioned trends. I'm curious about, you know, what other trends have you seen where it's like highly edited to not? Like, what are the other trends on the streets? <laughs> Yo, real quick, this podcast is not free. Cost of admission is sharing with a buddy who'd benefit or throwing it on your Instagram story. I guess we'll reshare that. On the streets is actually a trend, I would say, literally. Um, some of the best videos I've done, some accounts I've seen grow to like entirely on their own is on the streets interviews, or um, you may have seen where they like run up to people and it's like, uh, what do you do? How much you make in a year? Or uh, can I tour your apartment? I know that one's popular here in Chicago and in Manhattan. Um, so you know, that type of content does play well. Um, not surprising why I think people are generally intrigued by strangers and generally terrified of approaching them. So content where like two strangers interact, and you have no idea what's going to happen. It's interesting, just in its core nature. So 
that's done really well. Um, I do think the educational content is still getting pretty good views. Like if you're sharing knowledge and information with people that they don't have access to elsewhere, that is getting amazing play. Um, again, that they don't have access to elsewhere. So it's not, here's how to buy a home and 50 other videos that have done it. It's here's info on this specific development. And I talk to the developer, which is why I have it and nobody else does. Right. So sharing info that people desperately want, but don't have. Um, I think that will always be trending, but that has worked really well. And then the last thing that I don't know if this will cycle out, I'm seeing some changes, but again, messaging is really valuable. And you see so many things on Instagram, or I do at least where it's just a, a video like of nothingness, like background or someone working or doing something and words on screen. And for whatever reason, like my brain stops and I read those and I do stick around to see what that says. And if it's interesting enough, I'll even open the caption and read that too. So I do think some of the playing with just general B-roll footage, even boring footage, and putting valuable text over it is trending right now, has been trending for a little bit. That's been trending so hard. And I like, <laughs> I've been like considering trying to do that, but I cannot just, <laughs> I cannot take a video of me just doing something because I won't be able to like, do whatever I'm doing, you know, like type <laughs> thinking deeply, you know, like I, yeah. what? No, I need to think deeply by myself. I it just kind of like, I'm not ragging on those that can do it. Good for you. I can't, I feel it so feels cringe. So weird like, too. I think I did one where I was like reading, reading, you know, I was like filming myself <laughs> yeah. pretend to read on my couch, but you know, it is really weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, it's super weird. I don't, I don't know. I might never. Dude, I'm so gonna do one. it. Yeah. This inspired me. This is because I've been seeing them too, and I'm like, dude, that's that's like simple to film. Like, just do my. Or put my. I've seen entire yeah. accounts where they don't say anything to the page. Like, they don't address their followers other than it's just footage of like them and some words, or footage of them and a trending song, or they just do the trends. Like, if you scroll on Instagram or TikTok, because those are the scrolling ones for the most part. If you scroll and you see a video, like a trend two or three times, or you hear a sound two or three times, go make it. That's a good indication. If you saw it in 10 or 15 scrolls three times, it's trending or it's gonna be. So that's like when you see the videos where people are taping their phone to the ceiling and dancing under it, or you see the videos where like it's black and uh, the lights go out and they show like the, the flashing lights and things. Like there's a couple of them that we've probably all seen. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember seeing that. But if you, you actually pay attention, everybody saw that in some form or fashion. So you can kind of jump on that. But you also don't have to do that. You could just do one photo of you and valuable text. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, because there, there are so many different trends that you can do. Like, I, it, I think this is over now. But the one with the tortilla slap. Oh, my God. You know, with like holding <laughs> one. Maybe I should go on the streets of Tucson and be like, what do you think is the average? Are you ready to ho sell your home? No. <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do you know I'm gonna um, go viral <laughs> I did the on the streets here in Chicago when we did it I actually I did it for me and then we tried it in another business because I wanted to prove that the idea would go viral and it did so I love it uh she runs a bridal shop so I went around and I asked um how much do you think it costs to live in a certain neighborhood and then people were a little vague on that so I reframed and I said how much do you pay to live in this neighborhood how many bedrooms and bathrooms do you get and the reactions that people got were amazing because, you know, some people were like, you pay what for a two bed like that insane. So then, you know, neither here nor there how the comments go, but it was funny. And on the bridal shop, people would guess ridiculous amounts. And I thought that would be applicable to real estate, too. Like if you walked around, you're just like, what do you think that house costs? People have no idea. <laughs> they would they'd throw out some crazy numbers and that would be entertaining. I would watch that just to see what they think a house costs. Dude, I would, too. Also, uh, listeners, if you are liking this content and getting anything from it, make sure you go over to YouTube and subscribe and like this, um, the Agent Gold Mine. And also Matt Thomas's stuff. That's of right. But Matt, I want to talk, um, I want to talk about your tool. So, like, I, I don't know if you know this, but we ask all of our guests to provide a golden nugget for the Agent Gold Mine. So the agentgoldmine.com is where you can go and get your free golden nuggets from all our guests. And Matt. What did you bring for us today? So I gave you something that I use quarterly in my business to assess who it is I'm talking to, really, and to gauge if I'm actually speaking to an audience the way that I should be. What we're all doing every single day is like prospecting to meet new people and help them close real estate transactions. 
Who you choose to do that with varies by agent. Some people like working with first time buyers, some people like working with investors, you know, insert whatever your specialty is here. But I think too often when people first get in the business in particular, they try to generalize. It's like just shoot the shotgun and whatever it hits is what I'm going to do because I don't have any money, but also I just need to get started. And for a little while, that's okay. But over time, I really think you got to focus on something, right? Like what is your specialty? What do you deliver that is better than the other 2 million agents that you're competing with? Like, why are you valuable? And answering that question can be really difficult. So what this tool is, is reframing it a little bit in putting yourself in your audience shoes or putting yourself in our client's shoes and asking, what are their problems? What are they trying to solve? What physically, like, what is their demographic? How old are they? Are they male? Are they female? What do they live? What are their life struggles? What are they dealing with right now? Are your clients having problems with their kids at school? Do you not deal with people who have kids, right? Like understanding who it is that you're actually trying to communicate with day to day. And that's how I look at it because I use it for my social media. But more than that, understanding who it is you actually want to do business with and why and what it is you deliver that's valuable to them. I think that is an exercise that most of us haven't done in a while. And it's extremely valuable right? Like how often have we just been sharing knowledge and information, but we're not even asking ourselves if it's the right info to be sharing for what our clients need right now. And that's what this exercise is. This for me is like the level set of, are you answering your clients needs? Do you even understand your clients needs? Because if you can't make it through this, you might not. And that's part of it, figuring out how well you know your, your clientele. I, I really appreciate this too, because it, it walks you through it. It's not just like, here is what, you know, an ideal client profile or target audience is now go figure it out. It's like literally step one, what is the gender, you know, step two, what is the age? And it like really breaks it down for you. So listeners, this is super actionable. Um, question on, this is something that I've, I've heard a lot about blue ocean versus red. I don't think it says in here, but red ocean. Will you talk a little bit about that analogy and how you use it in your, um, client identification? I'm not sure I follow what blue ocean versus yeah, where so like there's a blue ocean or there's the red ocean and it's like where, you know, opportunity exists versus where everyone's already hunting. I believe that's the analogy. Is that Cook the analogy? For me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I'm sorry. Like, huh. words. <laughs> <laughs> so, um I would think about this. You generally know and you meaning like whoever's watching this right now. You are probably already aware of where opportunity exists. I think if you take a step back and like think about it, you understand where the opportunity is right now. It might be uncomfortable to look at where the opportunity is. And I'm feeling that in Chicago, for example, uh, what used to be a really easy way, frankly, to like grow a sustainable business is shifting because our market is shifting. So when I think about identifying opportunity, I'm always thinking like, Stop looking for the next thing. We talk a lot about AI on this. AI is the next thing. I like using it, but like refocus and come back because it's too far. It's too new. It's like we don't know enough yet. So like in Chicago, what do we know right now? Or in real estate, what do we know right now? I think the big opportunities that we have are mostly focused around solving client problems that have existed for the last several years. So access to housing that isn't available, uh, rates that are volatile and making affordability difficult. Uh, challenges in personal life and the ability to keep savings at home so that you can deploy them to buy a home. So like these challenges aren't new and the opportunities to solve them are already occurring. So when I think about like white versus blue or red versus blue, excuse me, and the idea of like looking to solve opportunity, for me, it's not as much forward looking. It's more looking at like what is happening right now, currently in the existing marketplace or maybe even the trailing six months, what's been really hard and like what are people struggling with the most, because that is probably the single greatest opportunity in all of our professional lives. Uh, if we just take a minute to like refocus and retune on it. So keeping that in mind, um, what is your, you know, if, if you did this recently, what does your client's profile look like? Yeah, I just, I just did my exercise Q1. So I shifted. Um, I do think part of that is the social side of things. Like um, I will say a cause or a side effect of using social the way that I have is now as I'm starting to do business with people who come through social as the lead point, I'm now getting more uh, growth that aligns with the demographics of those social profiles, right? So like, where my audience in life personally as a 32, 32 year old man in Chicago 
that's very different than what is engaging with me on YouTube or uh, Instagram, right? So this last year, my average client profile is actually a little bit younger. Um, it's, it's between 25 and 35. Um, mostly working professionals. Um, and I say between 25 and 35, because it used to be 25 to 30. And just this year, like a lot of people uh, in, in my like in their 40s, their late 30s, buying their second home, buying an investment property, buying a multi unit, that started to really click on the social. So I think that drove a little bit of the business. But they're usually um, a I would call them a high earning family. Everyone's opinions on earnings is different. High earning, they're making six figures for the most part. Most clients that are coming to me, and in many cases, they're dual earning six figure households. Um, and they're looking to make decisions for their future. So I'm dealing with young families who are like the husband and wife thinking about having a child, young family, or maybe pregnant with their first child. If they have their child, they're planning for the future. That's a great client, right? So a lot of mine is early stage life. Um, it's, it's people who are going through the same challenges that I'm probably facing. I just got engaged. So I'm getting married and planning on kids in a few years. So for me, it's like my clients are actually a little ahead of where I'm at in life, right? Like they're two to five years ahead of where I am personally, and I'm catching up to them, but they found me through social and we matched well. So I find it so interesting looking at the, those who follow us, you know, because as I'm making videos, I have like a couple of people in mind and usually they're like friends that I'm talking to. So I'm trying to be like just the most authentic as I can. Um, and I find such a big difference between my Instagram, which of course people knew me before I, I was a real estate agent. So they're, they've been following me. It's people in my circle, usually people my age. Um, so like also kind of between 25 to 35 year olds. And then you go to my YouTube <laughs> where I am focused on Tucson <laughs> and it is I mean, by a whopping majority, 55 to 64 year old men. I am not surprised at all. <laughs> it's so <Alex>. crazy. <laughs> hey. Uh, I love it. I don't, I, I don't, I guess we didn't talk about it. I actually was born and raised in Arizona, uh, in Mesa. Um, and I spent 12 years of my life there. So I know the Valley very well. My dad lives in Scottsdale. But when I think about Arizona real estate, like even my first thought is retirement community. So when you threw back like the average age on YouTube, I'm like, oh, yeah, they're thinking about where should I retire in 2024? <laughs> yeah. And, and I just moved to like this new community because uh, I move in to a new spot every year. So I'm really trying to like hyper focus on this specific new new build community. That's awesome. So therefore, it's like, yeah, a higher price. And therefore it's not 20, 25 year olds anymore. So it's interesting to see the differences, you know, like my, my Instagram, I get a lot of outbound referrals from that people in the military. Hey, can you connect me to a real estate agent? Yes. And then in YouTube, it's like, why is it important? Like, why should you live in Gladden farms in Marana, Arizona? Right. Well, so, and to that note, be careful what you yeah. put out, because I know people who go viral maybe for the wrong reason, or they have something hit uh, that they didn't intend to do as well as they wanted it to. And then you grow this huge audience that doesn't really understand what you do, or they're there for the wrong reason. Um, and that's a big part of like, when you talk about wh who's watching me, a lot of that is the content that I put out when I put out a lot of, Hey, here's rentals in Chicago. Yeah. My audience was 20 to 25 dead on. Like we're in it. Once I moved to, Hey, here's how to buy a multi-unit and house hack, or here's how to make an investment in a condo building along the lakeshore, all of a sudden we were shifting up. Now all of a sudden the 30 to 35 or 30 to 40 year olds were paying a lot more attention. Um, it, it's all about like the content and how you frame it and who's listening and receiving it. Again, going back to that exercise, if I wanted to hit rentals, I wouldn't be talking about multi-unit sales, right? That's just not what I would do. So you got to understand who you're trying to hit. Yeah. Ali and I talk about that a lot, actually, because both of us kind of came up in the investor agent space, like very much like investor, bigger pockets. Like yeah. that's all we talk about because we're trying to build our own portfolios. And then both of us realized that by talking about that on the internet and in all these conversations, that's exactly what we were attracting. And then we have like all of these like bigger pocket homies who have no money, a lot of them, and are like <laughs> just drinking the Kool-Aid without actually taking action, who are like knocking down our doors to work with us. And after, you know, enough of that, you have to take a step back and be like, oh, I'm the problem. Yeah. They're doing this because I am talking about this and I'm asking for yeah. it. <laughs> or, you know, I, I realized uh, I was making content for a little while and I've always been transparent with people. So when the market's bad, I'll tell you the market's bad. But then I realized the, depending on how I said that, 
it would predate how the conversation would go when I saw somebody in person. So I would, you know, run into them at the brewery and they'd be like, oh man, I saw your video. The market's real tough right now, huh? And I'm like, oh, I've already like pre-framed this conversation. I didn't even have a chance. Like I have to think about whatever they last saw from me is what they're going to take into this engagement. Um, and so I've tried to not, I mean, you can't avoid being negative. I'm not an overly optimistic person unnecessarily so, but I think uh, with everything you think about, I'm like, okay, if I say this and then I go talk to a client and they watched it, what is the ramification of that? What happens next? I'm always like filtering through that, that view. Leading right into what happens next for you. What, what's, what's next on your plate? Ooh, this year is going to be a busy year. Uh, the, so as you mentioned, growing all these social channels is not easy. So I do need to hire. Uh, I'm in the process of just hiring uh, to leverage myself out a little bit. So not so much um, an editor, I don't think. I think I'm just going to hire somebody to help me manage the content itself. Uh, come up with ideas, come up with scripting, come up with actual organization of a strategy of when to release it. Um, so sort of the in-house marketing role. Uh, I also am looking to bring on some more showing assistants just because I am at the point now where I can't be everywhere I need to be. So uh, scaling out by bringing in a little bit more assistance for me. Uh, the goal for my business next year, um, I do feel confident that we can get to 15 million this year. Uh, this year, we're in it. It's not next year, this year, 15 million. Um, so that's what I'm hyper focused on last year. I ended at eight, but I had the seven sitting there and it pushed in one single deal. So it's going to start this year, I think, but you know, it's like, I, I keep my sights on where we're headed and 15 is the goal. And you are going to achieve it. That's we're awesome. It, sitting on my board right Dude. in front of us. So I can't miss it. Good. As long as you continue doing the, the reels of you working on that's your business. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Really quick question on repurposing. Do you use AI or or is that what you're going to be hiring out? Um, or do you manually go in on each? I forgot to ask that. Earlier. Yeah, I have been using the AI. Um, once, once I trusted that it was giving me at least decent results, I was using that. Um, and then what I found is if I could use the AI to give me like 10 starting points, maybe a couple of them were pretty good. And then I can edit to make them even better, right? Or rearrange it to make it even better. So I do use AI to give me as much as a head start as possible. Um, uh, frankly speaking though, like think about the great content that you watch. Generally speaking, it's edited in a way that is intentional and it's edited in a way that keeps you there and it's got a strong hook and it answers your question at the end. And so, um, if you have somebody who can edit for you in that structure, every single way, hire them and do it, uh, just so you don't have to, but otherwise learn to do it yourself, get it down to a 20 minute thing and just start doing it per video. And then, so once you post that one video, do you, do you have a tool that repurposes that content to take it from Instagram to TikTok or whatever it is? I just repost it uh, manually. I found, so I've used some of those other apps. I can't find one and maybe things have changed since I did it. It's probably been six months. I can't find one where it'll universally do everything I want to do. There's always one that's like, well, we don't do TikTok or well, we don't do Instagram. So you got to do that one, man. And I'm like, well, if I'm already doing two steps, Instagram is to Facebook. I can repurpose it and copy the same caption for TikTok. It takes two seconds. That same thing can go on a reel in YouTube or a short in real in YouTube. It's the same process. So for me, it's um, you know, it's just become a habit of like you posted these three. And then thankfully, most of these apps now do have scheduling. So I can sit down and that's a new time block for me to actually schedule when content's gonna be released on each platform. It's just, you know, I and correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't found one where I can do it all in one place. Apple listeners, this short pause is to ask you for a review. Here's how to do it. Back out of the specific episode, go to the page where you see all the episodes, scroll down, keep scrolling, perfect. Now tap those five stars. Thank you so much, back to the show. And it's exhausting because, you know, every every person that we talk to or like on podcasts or outside of podcasts are like, look at this AI, check out this app. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, no, I wish there was like a master list of like, these are the only ones that you can look at for each category because it is. You know, I will ridiculous. say it's probably over talked about and I know I've heard about it on your show before, but like I do use chat GPT every day. Like it's sitting open right now in the background. Like I just have it there. Um, and I can't remember the first time I saw somebody do this, but I, I remember I was sitting and they answered the phone and somebody asked them a question. And while they continue the conversation, they typed that question in and asked how to respond to it to chat GPT. And my mind kind of like exploded a little bit. And I was like, wait, 
I never thought to like cycle everything through there. Like, how would you answer this in a polite way when you're angry, when somebody says you something, for example. Um, and so I've just started to lean on AI, maybe more than I should, but I just leverage it in that way, where it's my secondary filter on some things. Or if I'm having a particularly tough day, like yesterday, it was like, hey, look, I'm, I'm struggling for content ideas to come up with. Give me five YouTube topics that based on what you see in current SEO would be relevant for Chicago, right? Um, and it did. And I used one of them to create my last video. So that's where like, don't get too shiny object caught up in AI. Do understand where the value in your business comes from AI. And for me, it's tangible. It's like in a one to one transaction with a video editing tool or with ChatGPT or, you know, it's just to make things easier. Dude, I'm waiting for ChatGPT to get the the voice I feature know. where you can just ask it. <laughs> I can't, the type, I'm like, it's there. you have everything else and you can talk to this I think I'm, like, I'm pretty what? sure on your, you on your phone, you can do it. Can you? On your phone, you can do it now. Yeah, yeah on your yeah, phone. Download the app, app and try oh. it out. Uh, I will tell you, okay. still I'm a computer read it girl. because just like normal voice to text, like, I don't know, I had some pretty glaring typos in there that would have fundamentally changed what ChatGPT was going to spit out for me. <laughs> so... <laughs> Dude, and then you auto yeah, post like, nets when you go viral. Yeah. It's so, happening. I mean, it's uh, like it's a really easy way to get a lot of things. For sure. Okay, Matt. Before we're about to have heard into a yeah. wrap up. What did we not talk about though? That's like bursting from within you to share. Yeah, you know, the only thing that we didn't hit on that I just think is important for right now and for agents in our industry. There's like a lot of fud out there about like the sky might be falling and how many people are leaving and. This is an industry of ebbs and flows. I saw that when I was growing up as a kid. I've seen it personally. Now there are peaks and lows to this roller coaster ride, just like any other. But I think as long as you're focused on doing good business and bettering, sharpening your skills during this time period, you will win and the competitive marketplace will get easier for you. So like my, my one true like call out to all agents, because I feel so strongly that next year is going to be a great year for those who are ready for it is just hone your skills, figure out who it is that your message will be well received with and go after that party and just like, go get it there. This is a huge opportunity right now. That's going to stop this summer because it's an election year. So you have about six or seven months to really hit it before, you know, I think somebody's going to pull the e break as we wait to see what happens with our country. I 100% agree. And honestly, this is like the perfect golden nugget to be able to uh, narrow down and start the action, you know, like beginning of the new year, or no matter when you're listening to this, it's always good to fine tune who your avatar is after every transaction. Like, you know, like, what did you like from that, from working with that client? What did you not like? How can you avoid working with that type of person in the future? How can you get more of that type of person in the future? So the questions that you ask on that, um, on that golden nugget is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Of course. That. Um, for the, for the, uh, wrap up, out of all the tools that you use, uh, what is your favorite app or tool, either in your business or personal life? I'm not going to say Canva. I can't do it. Can. No, if it's you not can. my favorite. It I do like what it makes. Answer. I'm very proud of the Canva team. Shout out. But no, that's not it. Um, God, I, it, is it really going to be? A, it might be ChatGPT. I use this thing so much. And even just I'm so fascinated with it personally, like with AI and the idea of automating things. And um, I've used it more recently going into like the Dolly version and creating photos and going down that rabbit hole. Um, I just think it's a really cool thing to play with. I don't know if it's the most impactful in my business, although I will say it is changing how I do business. And I do think I'm getting a little bit better at some of these um, moments that were difficult, right? And it's that, like I said, I'll get an email that upsets me from a client and having something like you could talk to another person and ask them what they would say, but you don't always have that on the go. And so using ChatGPT to be like, okay, I want to respond to this in a polite and calm and professional and direct way. Give me an example and reading it and going, oh my God, thank God you sent that because I was going to send something so much worse. Like it's made me a better professional. So um, I will say that that has probably saved my ass a few times. Matt, what events are you going to in 2024? I'm on, I'm open right now. I haven't planned. I feel a little like, yeah, I, I guess part of that is uh, I am getting married in November. So like I have a lot to do in the near future. Um, but I, I don't have any big conferences. I will say last year I went to um, the social media con, which is like a, an all call for social media gurus around. And that was fantastic. I may very well do that again this year. 
um, and GrowthCon, which came through Chicago last year. It was more of a lender conference, but um, I just, the networking there was fantastic. So if that happens again, I'll probably jump on the Justin Lopat and Growth Pond chain. Early congrats on your Thank wedding. Thank you very much. That's super exciting. Yes, we're, we're getting married of in course. Mexico. So we have, uh, I have more phone calls coming in from Mexico, like day to day. And I'm like, oh, that's spam. Oh, wait, no, it's not. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Um, okay. Aside from referrals to Chicago, how else can we help you in your business? Yeah. Ah, wow. Great question. Uh, referrals to Chicago, always welcome. And I uh, just full transparency to everyone watching. I make a lot of referrals leaving Chicago too. So, you know, if you want to get in touch and you want to establish a two way street for referrals, let's do it. Uh, I would say things that would help me right now. If you have people in the um, Chicagoland area who you're aware of, who are actively creating that they don't even have to be in Chicago. I would say just other creators is who I'm looking to get in touch with. Um, making a lot of contents can be difficult and coming up with ideas can be difficult. And so doing that in a mastermind type setting with a group of peers that you respect uh, goes a long way. So I am currently in the process of like building out my network of peers who I want to create with in 2024. We can hold yourself, uh, each other accountable and make sure that we're growing the right way. So that's what I'm looking for. Perfect. And just remind everywhere, uh, everyone, where they can get in touch with you. Uh, yes, you. Uh, I have no shame and like never even thought about the fact that I shouldn't put my personal cell phone up on my Google business, but it is. And it will stay there because it's too late now. So if you Google Matt Thomas, <laughs> Matt Thomas Real Estate, I'm up there. You can see my old Google profile. But please connect with me on social at Matt Thomas Real Estate. Uh, I should pop up. It's M-A-T-T-T. -T -T. There's three of them. I know. God gave me three first names, believe it or not. But that's how it goes. So Matt Thomas Real Estate uh, on all profiles. Um, I'm always happy to connect. I do respond to messages. Um, if you feel more professional and you want to do the whole LinkedIn thing, I'm on LinkedIn too. You know, whatever works best for you. So, And then I will say uh, just my email is matt.thomas at bairdwarner.com. Sorry if anybody wants to actually be old school and send me an email. Uh, at Baird Warner is B A I R D W A R N E R. Matt Thomas at BairdWarner.com. Perfect. Yes. And if you haven't already followed us or the Agent Goldmine on the gram on YouTube, we are on there. We are Allie the Agent. We are the Shelby Show. Today's guest, today's golden nugget was amazing. Go check it out, theagentgoldmine.com for free. And if you enjoyed the show, please give us a five-star rating. Hello, we're waiting to listeners out there that enjoyed this and will have a, has a friend that will also enjoy this. Be a bro and share this show. <laughs> Allie, our first one. Um, Matt, just so you know, and I'll mark the clip. We do this thing where when we unmute, we're like, I'm next. Yeah. Until we <laughs> unmute at the same time. And then we're like, who's next? So, uh, Allie, do you remember your question? Yeah, I do. Uh, okay, go. Okay. <laughs> now I don't remember. Oh my God. Okay. Oh, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, dude. If you want the golden nugget that this guest provided, see the show notes or just go straight to theagentgoldmine.com. That's where we keep all our resources for you. Till next time.